And the way that the crypto space has historically tackled this problem is through redeployment. I'm going to take my application on Ethereum and move it to an L2. I'm going to take my application on L2 and move it to an even less secure L3. I'm going to build an Alt L1 with less validates. All of these ideas kind of get to the basic point that I'm going to decrease the security assumptions of my application, move it somewhere else, and that's how I'm going to scale. A coprocessor is a new paradigm. It allows you to keep your application where it is, on Ethereum, on L2, wherever you decide to deploy it, and to do more with it. To access types of compute that you otherwise couldn't. So to make this concrete, because this is an AI event, imagine you want an interesting inference within your smart contract. Well, in this situation, you need to be able to request that inference from your contract, and then receive back that inference with some degree of security around the result. An Oracle can be based on an economic assumption. A ZK coprocessor bases that assumption on proof, an indelible assertion of what that result is. I think I've spoken long enough that the panelists have rejoined me. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we are getting started. Um, sure. <laughs> oh, did we wait? <laughs> yeah, we, um, we can talk. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, I mean, let's just kick it off. Yeah. Uh, All right. So, works for me. Nice yeah, let's do you. it. Yeah, that's nice great to meet you. Mo, I've known you for a while. <laughs> yeah. Let's just, how about we talk about our project? Dylan, love to hear what you're working on. Let's do it. So, I am at the StarkNet Foundation. StarkNet is a L2 validity roll up uh, on top of Ethereum. We are not EVM. Uh, we use Cairo VM as a virtual machine as well as a domain-specific language. Uh, we've had some interesting progress lately. Uh, specifically, we are at right now 400 TPS capacity with a recent upgrade, uh, one second block time, some of the lowest fees around, and with additional improvements in our Stu Prover and Cairo Native, we expect to see exponential growth in this. Uh, Evan, on another panel from Mina Foundation, was talking a little bit about ingesting, um, using provers to ingest data, and we think we can actually do large learning machines ingest the data for the inference step as quickly as the inference stage actually occurs. And I'm quite excited about that. That's fascinating. Yep. I did not know Starcore was doing that. Yeah, we are doing some really cool things, but uh, you know, maybe you know, I'll just give a brief overview of the panel. I think we're missing two people here, but I think that's okay. Uh, just introduce myself. I'm from the Sarknet Foundation. We are exploring on-chain intelligence with a key focus on verifiable machine learning. Um, you know, I kind of want to just take this with a kind of approach of un answering kind of an underlying question along the lines of verifiable machine learning. How can we verify that computed results from other participants are derived according to specified model inputs, uh, model um, algorithms, and input data? And that's kind of where I really want to go into. So maybe we can start off with, uh, <laughs> we, got, we got another one here. Welcome. If anyone wants to join us, the last seat, uh, more than welcome. But maybe we can just start with a couple introductions. <laughs> no worries. I thought we were running a little bit late too. Okay, so maybe we can just start with you. Uh, latecomer, yep. you have to start first, so introductions and you go first. <laughs> Hi, uh, sorry for being late, everyone. Uh, my name is Hilma, I'm the founder of Gelado. Uh, Gelado is a robust platform. We have projects launched on ZK, optimistic rollups, uh, whatever you like, really. Um, and yeah, we have a bunch of experience with projects and AI launching their own chain. Uh, and we really see rollups as a uh, verifiable service that you can use for a bunch of cool stuff that I think we will be discussing in this panel, so very glad to be here. Wonderful. Mo? Uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, my co. So, uh, yeah. so uh, yeah. So uh, you know, uh, we I work on Brevis. I'm uh, the co-founder of Brevis. So Brevis is a zk coprocessor that uh, is in essentially a scaling solution that scales uh, that allows you to scale beyond the computation capability and capacity of a blockchain with off-chain verifiable computation. So you know, the focus is obviously. Um, you know, data-driven DeFi and many other uh, different use cases that can empower the access and the computation on historical blockchain data. And we've recently been doing a bunch of things on verifiable uh, inference, and uh, we'd love to share uh, more about that in the panel. 
Nice. And want to reintroduce yourself? Yeah. So for those of you who missed the you know, <laughs> several minute speech I gave at the start, <laughs> my name is Ismail. I'm one of the co-founders of LeBron. <laughs> We build a, a ZK coprocessor that focuses on uh, verifiable SQL computation, um, so data-heavy computation, um, which I think actually intersects in a very interesting way with thinking through how you have verifiable end-to-end -end inference all the way from both the data integrity of the input as well as <coughs> we get to a point where you can actually, unlike blockchain, we need to do these things, but uh, I think uh, Scalability, if you look at look at it from that lens, I think it's as well as the, the key bottlenecks. And of course, we have been running like ZK rollout to production as well, generating a bunch of proving uh, proofs, and it was very expensive. Uh, we're still not there yet in order to have the cost really come down. I think it depends on the computation you do. If you really focus on something simple, I think maybe you can do it. But from our experience, it's still a bit early there. Uh, but progress is there, so we, we see costs actually go down quite dramatically. Any other challenges you're seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, just to provide some very concrete example, right? So, like, you know, for verifiable inference, uh, there is like a very, very uh, interesting blog that if you guys are interested in verifiable inference uh, by Modulus Labs. So, you know, what they did was that they take the GPT-2 model, which is like it's not that that big model comparing to GPT-3 and GPT-4, uh, and you know what they did is that they tried to generate a zk proof of inference to generate just one word, hello. That's that's the one word they uh, you know they they generate like using um, you know kind of a, a zk proof, and uh, it took about like 96 hours of computation with like eight um, different parallel computing machines to actually generate that single word inference. So that is a how far our way, uh, how, how far away are we from uh, you know usable verifiable inference if we, we don't do anything like a, you know intelligent about it. So if we, if we just take a machine learning model and try to stuff it into a ZK prover, and this is like the performance we'll be getting. Now, the underlying reason for that is because you know, machine learning build models are really not friendly for ZK proof. Because you know, machine learning models use a lot of uh, uh, flow point uh, you know, numbers, uh, calculation, weight matrix, multiplication. And these type of things are inherently extremely hard to do and hard to prove using ZK proof. And uh, you know, uh, everyone in the ZKML space and the verifiable inference space uh, knows that uh, the, uh, the right way to actually approach this is to do model quantization and model pruning. Right? So, but the challenge there is that, uh, okay, if you do model quantization, which like cut down a bunch of like precisions in the numbers, and model pruning, which is throw away a bunch of like uh, waste in the model, then the model inference effectiveness also reduced a lot. Right, so like you know, many of the models, especially like the big ones, Llama and everything, is extremely sensitive to that. So now the challenge is like, how can we actually do a cross-layer optimization to look at not only just the model itself, but also look at the zk proving stack to collectively kind of optimize that. So this is like kind of a new direction that we are very interested in, and we kind of have been doing something, and also a bunch of our other teams are also working in, the, in, this, in this direction. Yeah, so, so thank you both for those, those great points. I think both in terms of cost and then in terms of kind of model optimization and model prover optimization. And to, to add an additional uh, layer to this, I think if we take a step back and kind of talk about you know, the art of on-chain intelligence the panel is, is called, one of the complexities is how do you consume an inference on-chain, right? The, the input to the inference as well as the proof of the inference both have to be verified at the point that you want the result of that inference to be used. So if your contract needs inference over you know, the, the state of a series of positions in order to determine how to rebalance based on historical performance. So you're doing a simple regression model for a yield aggregate. In that case, you need to verify effectively two things. You need to verify the input to that model, the data that you're using for historical performance, as well as the proof of the inference. There's some great teams in the space, like Modulus Labs, EZKL, and I think Brevis is doing some work on this now, too, that are focusing on the question over how do I generate a proof of that linear regression of that inference. What Lagrange principally focuses on is data and proofs of computation of a data. And so in line with that, we target the first part, which is how do you, in a scalable way, access the input data to that model on-chain such that any downstream things using that 
can trust that the data that they're using is correct. Otherwise, you reach the, you know, the proverbial garbage in, garbage out. I mean, that's a kind of really good answer. And you know, we were talking primarily about zero knowledge proofs, uh, particularly on the inference and training portion of it. But there are other models I think that we can use from a verifiability and privacy perspective, like fully homomorphic encryption, uh, MPC, TEE, maybe even differential privacy for the privacy part, maybe not for the verifiability part. You know, why zero knowledge proofs, or maybe you know, why? What are some of the use cases of these methods and approaches, and what are some of the drawbacks? And why do you pick uh, a certain method for yourself? I'll start with you, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can I can jump in. So there was a, a great article today that I saw on Twitter from Ishan from from the IML team. What he was talking about was something that he's calling intelligent DeFi. This idea of a new generation of on-chain DeFi applications that use data or inference in ways that are accretive to the core protocol function. They were built with the understanding that the primitives that everyone on the table is building exist. And this transcends all the way into how you would set a position on chain, how you do pricing in a more robust way, how you calculate funding rates for perks and options protocols, as well as things that are even more robust, things in social, things in consumer, things in gaming, the way you interact with a chain that personalizes to you the way an app does. You know, and I think it's no surprise for anyone in this audience that you know, some of the largest producers of machine learning in, in Web2 the largest consumers of computing web to do so to build models to personalize applications to you. And so, in line with your question, I, I think the next generation of on-chain applications in DeFi, social, and consumer are really building on top of the idea that the primitives that we build exist. Perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, you know, definitely check out that, uh, paper, uh, that blog post, which is very interesting. And uh, you know, also just to kind of come back to the question of like a different type of uh, verifiable computing methods, such as MPC, MPC, and ZK. Now, you know, how do you choose between them, right? So like MPC is basically you trust a hardware producer and a hardware vendor to say, okay, this ha particular hardware is probably secure. And also, sorry, this is like a kind of a TEE. So like, uh, you know, if, if you trust a, a particular hardware vendor is secure, which is in most of the cases Intel. And uh, you know, you basically do the computation in that environment and assuming that particular hardware won't be hacked. And for MPC, it is like multi-party computation where you basically have multiple different parties computing on the same thing. But mostly for privacy reasons, so you, want, you don't want to kind of review the computation and the input and also the computation process uh, to each other, right? So, and then you have ZK. So now I, I would argue that for machine learning and AI inference use cases, ZK actually have the optimal trade-off point. The reason for that is that for you know, uh, uh, TE and SGX-based solutions, if you just Google online, you know, over the last couple of years, just like last couple of years, there are at least three critical security issues that is reviewed. So, you know, in a way, you're still trusting a central party, which is a vendor of the hardware. And, you know, the central party will have errors and will have issues, and this has been proven time and again. So, you know, in that, in that sense, like TE, especially if you're driving critical intelligence solutions in DeFi, which touches a lot of a fund in that sense, where a high stake, you know, high amount of stake is, a, you know, high amount of asset is at stake, then, you know, TE might not be the, uh, uh, the ultimate solution. Now, the reason, you know, if we compare uh, TE versus ZK, ZK can be generated by anyone. It is much more scale in the sense of, uh, you know, kind of a computation resources and availability because you can actually tap into a very large pool of computation resources. Whoever has a GPU uh, or kind of a graphic card can actually participate in a decentralized approval network and generate a proof that cannot be fabricated, uh, you know, fundamentally. So that's why, you know, I think on that kind of a security point of uh, view, uh, ZK, if it is used in AI inference, is definitely uh, achieving better kind of a, uh, you know uh, he's achieving an advantage here of course there is uh, the currently the drawback of ZK is on the cost side so if you're using MPC there is additional cost 
but the cost is around one or two orders of magnitude right now. So, but if you use like a AI, uh, you know, inference directly on ZK without any kind of clever optimization, then that kind of, uh, you know, uh, inflation or computation inflation or latency infl inflation right now is about one million times. So that gap is there, but fortunately we'll be able to close that gap quickly by introducing very interesting things that are, you can cut down the model without loss of any accuracy, but at the same time design a uh, you know protocol in ZK that can prove this type of prone, especially prone model, um, you know for ZK, you know extremely efficient way to cut that you know barrier and cut that kind of uh, like latency inflation to maybe three, four orders of magnitude. So, awesome. I do want to move on to the next question. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in bringing some of these VML techniques? Uh, making some of these VML techniques practical for real world applications. Uh, Omar, maybe I'll pass it to you, and maybe we could talk a little bit about what Gelada is doing with Fox and copyright, because I think it is a very interesting real-world use case as well. Yeah, so maybe for those of you who don't know, um, Fox News, the U.S. media company, uh, has a, a roll-up on Gelato um, in order to prove the integrity of um, publishers such as the New York Times that they actually um, post content, um, that they actually are the original authors of content that they, that you as a consumer on your client sort of read. And basically what you have to you have hashes of that content stored in a roll-up that is controlled by them. And you can, in your client, in your browser, you can verify that this is actually the case. Um, and this is to prevent like phishing attempts and uh, fake news articles from being spread and, and these kind of things. Um, and of course we had a bunch of other security roles in production that we that we were running and uh, it was kind of like past tense in some of these uh, senses because uh, we, what we realized is um, today in the current world of let's say general purpose EVM state transitions, um, the cost and the latency that uh, ZK introduced was still quite large um, and we had chains running uh, that had very little usage um, in, like, in, in practice but they were already spending Sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollars per month on proving, um, and um, of course you want to recoup that from your users. But like, if that transaction suddenly costs a ton of money, then uh, this is not really a, a great solution. Uh, I think there are improvements to this. I think Sync just came out with like their SP1 OP Sync version, for example. So I'm bullish that this is uh, going to improve. Um, so cost is one. And then I think, uh, especially if you think about not general purpose blockchains, but for example, the use case we discussed with like DeFi, um, like smart DeFi, so to say, like DeFi is moving more and more off chain. I think like the, for example, the world of on chain AMMs and DEXs is over. Uh, LPs are just getting wrecked on chain. They're only consuming toxic water flow these days. You need to have MEVware off chain based systems in order to compete against like private market makers coming in and actually only consuming the, the retail, the good order flow. And for that, you need to have verifiable off-chain systems that can actually sort of enhance their on-chain smart contracts and there the biggest issue we have seen when talking to projects developing these things is actually latency especially if you go to trading or something you need to update pricing you need to uh, provide spreads uh, on like sub-second basis and if you want to zk file this whole system you would introduce like a 10 minute delay or, or, or whatnot right now so it's just not practical and so that's why people actually go into sgx and so on as alternatives because yes they might have bugs um, so we will all see provers and like circuits and stuff that people write and no one can really figure it out except the author so they can be parks in any type of software right but at least there the promise is the latency is, is slower and you can actually run them and compete against like centralized actors that um, are uh, just like updating things on a, on a sub second basis. I, I love the point about the cost latency trade-off. I, I think that's intrinsic to much of what proving is, right? The more parallel you go on something, the more you can typically reduce latency at the trade-off of cost, right? Wall time versus CPU seconds. One thing I'd also like to say, in particular with, with using verifiable ML of any sort on-chain, is the idea of directionality versus underwriting that directionality over time. I think in any industry, it's very easy to spot directionality, right? Asteroid mining is a directionally correct thing. You know, verifiable ML is a directionally correct thing. The nature of building a product, launching a business, or funding a business is, is 
the, the pursuit of underwriting that directionality over time with, with, with either capital or with your own human capital resources. And so with that said, when you're building an application today and you need to use ML because your user is requested, it's an imperative on you, not an academic pursuit, but something tactile, you have to ask, do the solutions that exist that provide the directionally correct solution of ZK for machine learning offer me the, the right cost and the right latency that my users require? And if not, do I have to, for the purposes of, of ML, reduce the security? Do I have to use an economic solution like Ritual, I think, is a, is a great example of that. Um, and I, with ML, where the overhead is so high to Mo's point earlier, that trade-off becomes increasingly important to make, especially if you're building on chain code today. Yeah, and uh, also another point to add here is really about the developer experience. So, you know, if we're using any sort of off-chain computation resources to do verifiable on uh, machine learning and post that result back to the blockchain, then it means that we're changing the paradigm of how uh, developers are building apps today. Uh, today, every developers are building application in a synchronized sort of fashion where, where, where they call a smart contract function, the function returns the, the result in the same transaction. But, you know, if we're tapping into any type of off-chain computation resources that for AI or for other things, you know, you're changing how they're thinking about building the application because now the developer need to build and write like callback function to receive some result that is processed in an asynchronous way from the off-chain world to the blockchain, uh, back to the blockchain. Now, you know, how we can actually improve that is to give user a good abstraction and give developer a very good abstraction so they don't feel that way. They feel that they're still building on the same chain. They feel that still they, get, they can get the, uh, back the result in the same transaction. So this is something that we think uh, can also be very helpful uh, in the long run for, uh, for the off-chain verifiable computing um, space. Awesome. I think these are all really good points, but I do want to bring it back to one point that Ishmael, well, one and a half points that Ishmael was bringing up. The half point is asteroid mining, and we can turn this into an asteroid mining panel if you guys want. Uh, or we can go with the real question. Um, you know, you were mentioning some of the economic uh, policies, uh, incentive schemes, and maybe we can go into some of those areas as well. How can we kind of encourage, through economic incentives, potentially, uh, honest participation and making sure that the machine learning results are actually correct on the blockchain? What was it that Charlie Munger said? <laughs> show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just very briefly make a point there, and then obviously I'll pass it to you guys because I don't want to stop the other room. But um, the, the nature of comparing an economic solution versus a ZK solution is typically a comparison between cost of compute versus cost of capital, right? Money is not free, stake isn't free, economic security isn't free. You have the risk free rate on the capital plus the marginal risk added by any ability for the protocol to sanction that capital, the slashing risk, if you will. But on the flip side, the ZK approach is typically much more expensive in terms of compute. And so for different types of computation, you have to continually weigh those two numbers. For data-heavy computation, SQL, like Lagrange does, we, we did those comparisons, and very simply, we found the result was that the ZK solution was head and shoulders cheaper. But for ML, we haven't. It's not necessarily a focus area, but that comparison still is relevant to make. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for off-chain uh, verifiable machine learning, uh, you know, crypto economics uh, security and crypto economics design is actually going to be playing a very, very important role. Now, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, we all know uh, if we're just using pure ZK for machine learning, the cost is going to be astronomically uh, high. And, uh, you know, but there's a famous saying in computer science that is one layer of indirection solves every computer science problem uh, as long as you find the right trade-off to make, right? So now there is a, a very nice trade-off if we introduce crypto income security is that uh, we can trade off cost with latency. So basically the idea here is that uh, instead of uh, computing everything in ZK and generate ZK proof, you can use just like an optimistic roll-up a proposer or a group of proposers to propose the uh, set inference result on chain directly. 
And uh, there can be a watchtower, uh, a, a cluster of a watchtower watching these results and redo the computation without using ZK, of course. But if there is actually a uh, you know, uh, detection of kind of a malicious or faulty computation that is posted on chain, then a challenge process can be triggered during, the, uh, during a kind of a security delay process. And during that security delay, you can submit a challenge by actually generating the ZK proof. So it delays um, or it, it essentially kind of amortizes the ZK proof generation cost by using this kind of a latency based uh, uh, you know, proposer plus challenge based architecture, right? So using this architecture, we can bring verifiable inference to blockchain much faster because how the economic incentive will be set up is that if you, guess, if you, if you can actually generate a, 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 a fraud proof, then whoever proposed the, this initial result will be slashed and will be kicked off, out of the system. Now, you know, with that kind of, uh, you know, uh, security guarantee there, uh, you can actually have a fully verifiable inference without actually using and leveraging and incurring the cost of ZK proving every time. So. Awesome. Uh, Ilmar, if you have anything to add, otherwise we can move on to the next question. Yeah, maybe I think a yeah. fun point maybe to mention is that um, ZK is kind of like, in, in some cases, a bummer because um, it kind of eliminates one of the core use cases of like tokens, right? And I think uh, crypto, uh, the killer use case in crypto right now is projects actually launching tokens for a bunch of stuff that they want to fund, right? And uh, a token really only makes sense if you use it to, like my opinion is tokens only make sense if you use it to bootstrap economic security for a network that has to come on consensus around some deterministic function that produces certain outcomes, so certain outputs. And of course, kind of like ZK is, uh, kind of like doing the same, so uh, in that sense, ZK is kind of like getting rid of a bunch of use cases for these tokens that projects have, um, and that's why a lot of projects these days maybe not release a token anymore because they say ZK uh, is doing can do this uh, much better, uh, more secure. Uh, but I think the reason why this probably won't, won't still be the case in the next like one to three years is, I think, as I already said, like latency. Uh, a lot of projects I talk to that need sophisticated object computation for like DeFi strategies and so on, they all go the way of either having like SGX or TEs or having like a sort of pre-confirmation layer or something like a proof of, cons proof of state consensus on some uh, deterministic function and then you have the sort of uh, Oracle, uh, which might be a ZK, uh, that can on demand be called to like settle a dispute whether this optimistic output wasn't actually correct. Yeah, Mo, I'm going to pick on you for this one. Yep. Um, how do you see kind of the adoption of verifiable ML uh, leading to the adoption of open source frameworks versus proprietary AI models? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very uh, interesting question, right? So like, does verifiable uh, ML means like uh, you know open ML? Uh, well, they are not actually equal uh, because verifiable ML, for example, even if you have like closed source model, this is like what we have seen with some of our yield aggregator partners. Uh, they have some model, and in the model there are, there are some weights. Uh, obviously, you don't want to publish the weights to the entire kind of a blockchain to see. Okay, this is like your strategy to rebalance between different vaults. Right, so, uh, but at the same time, you, they want to offer uh, to the uh, uh, you know, users and also to the uh, kind of uh, end users uh, some level of assurance that they're following certain kind of models. It's just that the way it is hidden. Right, so now this is where uh, ZKML and uh, you know, verifiable inference actually come into play, where using ZK, you can make a commitment to a model basically saying uh, that to the blockchain that, hey, I am going to use this kind of model going forward. And uh, this, there are some of the ways that are hidden, but they're not going to be changed dynamically on the fly. Right? So with that, you know, because that is essentially kind of a, a verifying key that is on the, on the blockchain as a commitment, and whatever the computation result you generate the, after that, will be able to verify against that initial commitment basically telling the user that, hey, I'm moving your money, not because I want to, or because I just want to kind of move it uh, arbitrarily, but I'm following, following a pre-committed pre uh, strategy that is following certain model, it's just the weights are hidden. So that's actually adding the benefit of uh, ZK in the privacy sa uh, sense uh, to the uh, verifiable inference as well. Interesting. Um, yeah, kind of curious, one, 
you know, as we're sort of wrapping up, I do want to kind of get your perspectives on some of the potential regulatory frameworks that might develop over time, especially in some of these more sensitive fields where machine learning might be used for healthcare data uh, or financial information. Currently is, but it's locked behind a black box. We're kind of opening it up uh, using zero knowledge proofs for verifiability purposes and privacy purposes. Uh, how can we think about it from a regulatory framework? And you know, do you see any potential issues uh, with government and regulatory agencies associated with this? Yeah, so I, I started my career working for an insurance company that did life insurance. Probably not the best decision, but it was a great learning experience. Um, and I like to say that the hardest thing that I had to deal with was, was trying to get five insurance companies to agree to share any amount of data with each other. Harder than ZK, harder than raising venture financing, just to convince five people to share data. It was, it was the most difficult thing I think I've ever dealt with because the moment you get an agreement between five of them, another 100 lawyers jump in and a, half the company's up in arms about what happens if something goes wrong with some aspect of the data being disclosed improperly, what the regulatory issues are, if, if if quantum computers break the encryption that was used to share the data in 30 years, if people form death pools on top of the insurance market, it just it snowballs into endless fear. And this is something that fundamentally cryptography provides a natural solution to. Trustlessness extends beyond blockchain applications. It extends into Web 2 in ways that I think it's very hard to appreciate. And I think with machine learning, where the demand and the appetite for data is larger than I think ever before, and the impact across an industry of an aggregation or, or, or an agreement to share that data can be higher than I think any company can independently reach without such a consortium, cryptography finds a very natural home. And I think zero knowledge in particular is something that will be used and is already being used by some companies in that space. Yeah, I think I'm actually very bullish on regula regulators pushing the adoption for ZK in the future. Like when I was watching the US election debates and um, you have both candidates are like making their points and you don't really know what's true, there's some cats being eaten and Springfield <laughs> or something like this, right? Um, how great would it be if you basically had like a model in the background which is like fact checks all these things that these people should say in real time and just outputs uh, if it's true or not. But then of course the question is uh, who wrote that who wrote model, the model? Who <laughs> controls this and what sort of model is actually being used? And you can think of like, let's say, um, the, 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 the owner of this model has to open source or make this model public and the biases to the regulators, they can verify it and then with providing you with this output, they provide a proof that you don't even need a blockchain to verify, you just have like on your TV or on your MacBook, you just on your client verify that this computation was actually run correctly and now you know that, okay, this model was approved by the US regulator and it actually fact-checked the politician. I think that's kind of like the world we hopefully will move towards and a lot of this, I think a lot of the cool use cases are actually not on-chain. They're like, just ZK, you verify them and you're fine and that's it. If you want to trigger some payments and stuff, then of course on-chain becomes cool. Uh, but I think just knowing on your machine that is, uh, has a, the, the computation and integrity, I think is a good use case. And also, you know, just a very concrete example, they're like AI doctors, right? So, you know, if uh, AI doctor eventually becomes something, which I think it will, um, you know, regulatory and ZK uh, will actually combine that direction, uh, you know, I think in a very efficient way. Uh, because like uh, for, uh, you know, because like, if, well, let's say you want AI to read a CT scan, and uh, the AI basically spit out some information saying, okay, you know, you got this uh, particular disease or not. So how, do you, how can you trust that model? Do, how do you know that model itself is actually consuming sufficient amount of uh, computational resources to generate user result? Uh, you know, so there you can actually use a ZK, a verifiable model uh, to basically say, hey, look, this model and this inference result actually come from a model with like three billion uh, parameters or like six billion parameters. ZK can do that uh, without even revealing what parameters are. They can just like say, okay, this is the amount of parameters and this is a pre-committed model where everyone can check this is a common model everyone uses. So yeah. I, I hope you're not using an AI 
on Dr. Mo. I need you on the next panel. <laughs> I mean, I just use WebMD. Coughing, a after this conference, I'll write coughing, sore throat, and then WebMD will just tell me I'm dying. So <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, but yeah, I think for the final couple minutes, maybe we could just chat a little bit about any particular research piece area that you're kind of really interested in or some type of application and use case that you'd like to see um, in the near term or long term. And uh, we can close off with that. Yeah, so this is a, a little bit going to sound like a non sequitur, but I'm bringing it right back. Dynamic pricing for compute, um, in particular, how one can price compute in a two-sided marketplace with suppliers and um, obviously demand for that compute. Which and do kind of quantization in a very interesting way to generate a specific model type. And this model is going to retain the same level of uh, accuracy and same level of precision, but at the same time extremely friendly for ZK to prove. That will give you like a thousand, three orders of magnitude difference in terms of proving performance. So this is something that we have been working on for a while, and uh, we'll be presenting that in ZK Summit. Last word. Very quickly, I think um, I'm personally excited about um, the DKBMs coming to production, especially on like the OS optimistic rollups. Uh, Succinct just released their OP Succinct version, um, and apparently costs are going down quite dramatically in all these areas in the past, in the next about 12 months from now. So, this will significantly improve scalability for like, blockchains in general um, and also interoperability. And then I think um, I like DeFi, and I think uh, DeFi is being complexified a lot. Uh, we are moving to like predictive models being used for decentralized DeFi protocols such as on-chain DEXs trading that have like the off-chain lag um, that vertically integrated the MEV pipeline um, and these become very hard to actually make verifiable and decentralized and uh, there I'm, I'm quite interested in like, how ZK can help uh, over time because we see a big trend of uh, on-chain trading moving to this, and I think this is the latest case of it. Amazing. Well, Ilmar, Mo, Ishmael, thank you so much for joining. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to pop up after the conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you all, guys. So uh, it's really too close to the end of our events. We, already, we also have one keynote and one, one more final thanks for all of the participants. So next, we will have to invite Ro, CEO and co-founder of 